Hello everybody, hope everyone's doing all right. I'm kind of excited, I, I recently crafted a new sketchbook and it's gonna be called my Anatomy Codex. And so the idea behind this book is that I will practice a specific aspect of anatomy. So like in today's case, I'm practicing faces with everybody. And then I will show you how I apply what I learned practically to all of my drawings. And I want to show you all of the steps involved and all of my thought process that goes into not just drawing, but learning how to draw. So I wanted to practice drawing faces today. Where does one even begin with this? Well, I always start off my practice sessions with a generous dose of curiosity. I want to get to the very root of the topic at hand. Whenever I'm drawing a face, I'm thinking about the skull that lies beneath the skin. It is the features of the skull that determines what a face looks like after all. So I practice drawing the skull until I become so familiar with it that I can draw it from memory basically. And this has taken a lifetime of drawing many, many skulls and it's almost never perfect, but I wanna be able to at least create a low poly version of a skull in my head that I can use as a foundation for all of my other faces in the future. So I use anatomical reference while I draw, but I only look at it when I'm unsure about something. Me personally, I have difficulty drawing the skull from really strange angles, so I try to picture a skull from a view that I'm not used to drawing, and then I draw it, and I check with my reference to see if I'm close enough or if I'm off in some way, and then I make adjustments mentally to fill in the gaps of my understanding. Sometimes I need to do this a few times with like a really difficult angle, but over time it becomes easier to just rotate the skull in my head and then draw it from that angle. I usually try to simplify it most of the time unless I'm actually trying to draw that exact skull, but usually for most drawings I'm just doing a really crude version of the skull, so no need to do that. When simplifying the skull, I try to create a wire mesh version in my head. Uh, I used to do 3D modeling, so for me it helps to have this version of a skull in my head. And I draw this version a lot to help me remember what the building blocks of the skull are. And sometimes when I draw it, the proportions are not quite right. Um, but they are easy to fix when you're not bogged down with all the details. So I, I don't worry too much about it unless I'm, you know, trying to draw a perfect skull. I also try to keep in mind how the skull connects to the spine. For me, it's easy to overlook like the bottom part of the cranium. So I always try to draw stuff like that I never see just to build up the mental library in my head. And it also helps to know exactly how the spine connects to the skull when you're drawing faces as it kind of dictates how the neck contorts and bends. It adds a, a level of believability to your drawings. Having a good understanding of perspective is key to drawing pretty much anything. So the skull is no different. It's just a big box that can be divided into various proportions and planes. And once you have these building blocks of the skull, you can apply them to pretty much any of your drawings with a lot less hassle. Once I refresh my memory with the skull, I make a few sketches with the skull attached to the neck muscles. I try to think about how the muscles squash and stretch depending on how the head is oriented. And I find that my drawings work out best when I take the time to build up a solid foundational drawing before I go in and add character and details. Sometimes I try to do the groundwork in my head, but I always end up struggling way more than if I had just done the underdrawing this way. I think I just get lazy and I want to do the fun stuff right off the bat and I always end up regretting it later. Also, having good reference goes a long way to help you understand how the head and neck affect each other. Uh, but over time, I would try to push myself in another direction where I try to create natural poses from imagination. Something I've recently become more aware of is the idea of flowing S-curves and C-shapes, using lines of beauty to help convey gesture and movement. But that's a topic that I want to discuss in another video. I know a lot of this foundational stuff can seem kind of boring to a lot of people, but I always think about it like I'm building a house. Like you wouldn't want to build a house upon shaky foundations. So I always like to go back and rebuild on any part of my foundation that isn't rock solid. So once you get the foundations right, you can furnish your house with decoration, which is how I think about like adding character and appeal to your faces. The hardest thing for me, and like in my opinion, is capturing the essence of a person. I think you need to be able to observe people from life and really take note of how people's faces and expressions change with certain emotions. There are subtleties that can make or break a drawing. I've drawn many faces and the thing that I've noticed is that the smallest tweaks to facial features can have the most drastic effect on the way the face looks. 
like the shape of the nose, the space between the eyes, or the length of the mouth, all of these things all work together in concert to define the look. And the underlying skull shape dictates how these features manifest themselves in the drawing. So I try to see every face I draw as an opportunity to play with design. I try to treat the hair the same way I do like calligraphy or something like that. I try to give it a flow in a graphic shape language. The facial hair is also a fun way to kind of play with this. And for these drawings, I wasn't too concerned about clothing, but um, they do. Ha there, there is an opportunity to convey character through clothing. So I tend to ask myself like questions like, what is the profession of this person or how do they feel about themselves? Are they wealthy or did they live out on the street? And these questions help me uh, decide on like what this person is. And I try to convey it through the drawing. Um, but sometimes I just browse for reference and I try to do like a mishmash of ideas from whatever I'm looking at and that helps too. Something that is worth practicing is drawing people of varying ages. Um, I find myself rarely drawing elderly people these days. <laughs> Nothing against old folks, but I think I just developed like a comfort zone with drawing certain age groups. Um, kids also seem to be something I don't draw that much. Um, but having a good understanding of the key differences in the face shapes of various ages is something worth doing, I'd say. I also tend to avoid drawing hyper-realistically, and I find that when I'm drawing something like that, it's better to rely solely on reference because my mind can't come up with all the subtlety and nuance involved with like real faces. So instead, I try to draw faces in a more simplified way. I'm, I'm basically leaning more towards stylized just to make it easier on myself. But I used to do hyper real drawings and colored pencils from photographs, uh, but it's just not as fun for me these days, so I, I tend to work more this way now. I used to do a lot of caricature drawings, and so I tend to find myself exaggerating faces a bit. And there is a sweet spot involved with doing that. Um, it's easy to go overboard, and after drawing enough faces, you get a good feel for what looks right and what doesn't. And there are certain things that I try to avoid. The biggest thing that messes up my faces is not following the rules of perspective well enough, and I end up messing up my eyes that way a lot. Another thing is drawing the eyes too close to each other or too far apart, and the size of things sometimes, like I'll draw an eye that's like too big or the nose is too small, and sometimes it takes me a while to notice what's wrong, and sometimes I just end up experimenting with different things till, till it looks okay. Another thing that's crazy about faces is that real faces are full of imperfections, so drawing a face that's too symmetrical or too perfect can look kind of strange. While, while I'm drawing these faces, I was looking at a bunch of other artists for inspiration and I was trying to figure out what I liked about their drawings. And the things that stood out to me is that all the faces had unique imperfections that added to the personality. So like something sim as simple as the way a nose can be slightly crooked or hair can be messy. Uh, these are the things that really add to the believability of the faces. So I also did two pages, one for males and one for females. And the female faces all had like pointier chins and more soft curves, smaller, less defined noses, more voluptuous hair, things like that. And the male faces tended to have more angular shapes and more square jaw lines and stuff. And you can make like more feminine men and you can make more masculine women simply by turning up the dials or turning them down on these features. Something that boggles my mind is artists that can draw faces with really good economy of line. Like I want to get better at defining a face with like a few as few lines as possible, but I'm not able to do that yet. As I've gotten older, I find myself trying to do more with less, and in drawing that means I tend to work less with tone and more with line. And this is something that does not come naturally to me at all, so... I mean, I learned to draw more like a painter and not as an animator, and but that doesn't mean that there's no, anything wrong with either approach, it's just something that I noticed about myself. So when I do add color, I think in tone, and coloring a drawing is always fun when the line art is solid, but if the line art is too vague or too messy, I usually end up making way more mistakes when I'm applying the color, so I always try to make sure that the foundation drawing is at least good enough to start adding color to. So the paper in this sketchbook wasn't the best for watercolor, but it also didn't really warp that much while I was drawing, so... The thing is it caused the colors to absorb way too quickly and this ended up making for some messy situations here and there. 
but I've kind of gotten used to it over over the years working with these types of papers but yeah if you're going to use watercolor don't be like me use the proper paper so when it comes to coloring in my sketchbook I tend to use really earthy colors and a somewhat limited color palette and I try to do the bare minimum when it comes to doing color work because I'm not really trying to get fancy in here and I'm doing if I'm doing like finished illustrations I try to explore like a more dynamic lighting setup and you know add rim lighting and stuff like that uh, but I plan all that stuff out beforehand I don't just do it off the cuff and when I'm sketching in color um, I just add a bit of tone to my sketches you know to kind of give it the same sketchy feel and working this way leads to some happy accidents and some serious disasters but it's pretty stress-free and you get used to what looks good and what doesn't over time uh, I also notice I use red, yellow, and blue the most out of all the other colors and I think I tend to prefer mixing my own colors rather than using the pre-made stuff. I used to work digitally and I did a lot of color work back in the day and then out of nowhere I just kind of just stopped and haven't really gone back to digital in such a long time. Something about drawing traditionally, there's this tactile quality to it and when you're working traditionally, uh, through these little happy accidents that are harder to come by when you use a computer and you also end up with a physical tangible thing at the end of the day which is nice little bonus for all your efforts the reason i use watercolor or why i prefer it to use it most of the time is because i'm the fastest uh, with watercolor and i'm the slowest with colored pencil and i would prefer to use alcohol markers if cost wasn't an issue and at one point i was using all of them at some point but I always seem to just gravitate to watercolor and I tend to appreciate other artists who work with watercolor because I know how unforgiving it can be. I recently went back to using gouache in my world building book and I found that the gouache actually behaves like watercolor when it's dried up but still has a more painterly look when applied. So I've been having fun using gouache as well and I think dried up gouache is my new favorite medium all of a sudden. I could wax philosophical about color theory all day, but I think I'll make a video detailing my thoughts on that some other time. There are some things that I try to avoid when applying color, like I don't like using straight up black for my palette ever, and I try to work light to dark, but not always. If I do mess up, I just move on because the paper can't handle being reworked that much, and I also try to think in terms of grayscale. Like, if I remove the color altogether, would the image still hold up? And if it does, then I know uh, the colors are right, usually. Something I want to try to do more of in the future is playing around with lost edges and hard edges more. And it's something that's pleasing to the eye and can be used to grab a viewer's attention or imply atmospheric fog and distance. But it's kind of a balancing act as you need to be able to maintain visual coherence and sometimes I guess it's easy to go overboard with too much of one or the other. As an artist, you're always trying to direct the viewer's eye and one of the easiest way to do this is with color, creating lots of contrast in a certain area or using a really vibrant color in a mostly desaturated piece. It's really fun to play around with these things and you can start to pick up on it when you look at other artists' work. You can see how they direct your eyes and I almost never think about these things. And if it shows up in my drawings, it's usually by accident or happened on a subconscious level, maybe. I don't know. Ooh, something interesting about color and faces is that human faces have this like temperature map thing, which basically shows where redness in the skin is most prominent, like the ears, the nose, and the cheeks. And it's it's like this really cool thing to be aware of because it's something that can really add a sense of believability to your drawings. And it's something that I forget about when I'm drawing, but if I do remember to emphasize the redness in the cheeks or whatever, I usually don't regret it. Coloring in hair is probably my favorite thing to do when I'm drawing faces. Like when I add color to hair, I feel like I'm painting clouds or something. It's funny, you can draw clouds wrong and you can also draw hair wrong. Uh, but the way I like to think about hair is I see it as a whole bunch of flowing ribbons and I try to light it the same way. But I find it's really forgiving at the same time, like it's not as crazy hard as you think. Um, like when when doing a blonde person's hair, it's really, it's not just yellow, it's, it's like a bunch of different hues of greens and reds. It's similar to like the way you would approach drawing gold or something like that. One of my favorite color combos of all time is a red head of hair and some green eyes. Something about that just really speaks to me. 
One of the best parts of doing an exercise like this is that you can really experiment with different eye color, skin tones, hair color, and you, you get to see what works and what doesn't. That's what practicing like this is all about. Then when it comes time to do like a finished piece, you know what works and you can just use one of your sketches to, to build up on like as a foundation. Since I did these sketches with blue coal erase pencil, the color I applied tends to drown out the line art. So I like to go back to re-emphasize the line art a little bit and I tend to do this as the last step. And sometimes I use like a red pencil as well to give it like a unique look. And some people like to lay down some black ink, but I prefer the sketchy feel I get by doing it this way. Something I always thought would be interesting is to start all over with art. Just go back to the very beginning, knowing what I know now, and see how I would approach things. I guess these practice sessions will allow me to do that, and also archive it as I progress further. If I could talk to the younger beginner artist version of myself, I would tell him to really hammer down on the fundamentals. I would tell him perspective is your best friend, to take the time to exercise the memory muscles. Don't be afraid to try new things and new mediums. Don't get lost in playing the comparison games. Always strive to draw better than you did yesterday and work on your confidence as much as you work on your art. And most importantly, never forget why you do art in the first place. Thanks for stopping by. I hope to see you guys in the next one. See you later.